Well, the hype has died down, and you know what that means. All us super analysis freaks have our grubby hands all over has been Hotel, picking it apart word by word, and generally probably having a better time than when we had to do this with Beowulf. Uh, the epic poem, not the weird movie with Angelina Jolie. Or maybe some people enjoyed that. Personally, not my thing. I like musicals that criticize traditional religious structures. What can I say? Hi, I'm Kira. I love analyzing things and also happen to love has been Hotel, so I am living for this time when we're really getting into the meat of things. And the meat I want to get into today is, is Charlie Morningstar a good protagonist? Or perhaps more specifically, is she a good female protagonist for a show like Hasman Hotel? Because that distinction is actually really important. It gets into what we as audiences want from modern heroines because that's really muddled at the moment as well as how well Charlie fits into the structure of a musical. Why am I a little cartoon version of myself in this video, you might ask, why am I show my face in others? Because I'm reading my script off a screen and don't feel like mugging for the camera. That's all. Enough introduction and let's get into this. So, is Charlie a good female protagonist? Uh, disclaimer, I think she is a good protagonist in general, so that may color my perspective, but I did really try to dig into the reasons she wouldn't be to try to give a fair analysis. In fact, I'd probably lean towards more critical in this video to try to compensate for my bias. This video is split into four parts. What do we as audiences expect from female protagonists these days? The ways that Charlie can be seen as a bad protagonist, the ways she can be seen as a good protagonist, and what is the ultimate decision? So what do we expect from female protagonists these days? For many of us, especially coming from animation lovers, which I think has been has attracted in absolute droves, the earliest examples of female characters were Disney princesses, ones like Snow White and Sleeping Beauty, who were reliant upon the men in their life to save the day. While there were some notable female lead in live-action films like Judy Garland, Audrey Hepburn, and Vivian Leigh from Gone with the Wind, which was a massive hit when it came to audiences and critics alike, these women were often very passive when it came to the events of the story. Without sounding overly critical, Dorothy does not actually make many of her own decisions when it comes to the plot of The Wizard of Oz. Her entire journey set in motion when she accidentally kills the Witch of the East and then is sent on a mission by the wizard to kill the Witch of the West. Audrey Hepburn was a star of the romance genre and often paired with male stars of the times, and Gone with the Wind is naturally a romance, so these not live-action movies, while they got more progressive with time just like their animated counterparts, I love to point to Bianca from The Rescuers when it comes to a female lead I really love out of the Disney movies that came out of Disney's Dark Age. Uh, there was definitely still a cap on what women were allowed to be. When it came to television, variety shows were highly popular, most often with male hosts. Again, exceptions, but we're going with general trends. Though with the birth of sitcoms, female characters did come into the spotlight a little more in shows like I Love Lucy, which was a smash hit featuring a goofier take on the suburban housewife. Television continued to evolve from there. By the time U.S. programming hit the late 50s and beyond amongst the mess of McCarthyism and the politicization of TV in general, Thanks, Vox. Not only were sitcoms popular, but westerns, quiz shows, medical dramas, soap operas, a huge range of shows available now to watch. And some women made their mark on history in this time period, like Carol Burnett in the late 60s. I know I'm leaving people out, but I want to keep this video fairly short, so I'm sorry to the wonderful, wonderful women I'm not mentioning. However, in my eyes, it was with the 80s that women in media really began to flourish within the context of female stories that began to flood the market as women flooded the workforce. I'm talking about Golden Girls when you turn on the TV and movies such as Steel Magnolias, 9 to 5, Beaches, these stories that focused so wholly on women's experiences so while there might have been men and romance involved, the story focused so much on the bonds between female characters and the female experience in a way that just hadn't often been done before. This trend continued into the 90s with films such as A League of Their Own and The First Wives Club, running up into the 2000s with what many of us grew up with, Legally Blonde, Charlie's Angels, Miss Congeniality, this is a long list. Golden Girls was joined by Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Charmed, Sex in the City, the way that women started to be represented in visual media just exploded, and with that representation, what women could be in media expanded rapidly. Uh, now, this doesn't mean things were perfect by any stretch. San Diego University has monitored women in top 100 grossing films since 2002, which makes it the most comprehensive study out there. In 2023, the percentage of women with speaking roles was 35%, with women in major roles at 38%, protagonists at 28%. 
18% of films had more women than men, 5% were even split, so with fewer women on the screen, naturally there's a less chance to explore women in leading roles even after they begin to appear there. The fact that there are far more movies with women as protagonists, but movies with an equal number of men and women represented, shows that women do continue to exist in stories about women, which are important, but fail to delve into the politics between men and women. And with only 35% of major characters in these top 100 grossing movies being women, this also shows the dominance of men in movies in general. We have yet to truly explore what it is like to simply have media that are not men's or women's stories, but just stories that happen to involve men and women in equal parts. And in that time period, since the female character boom, what we as a culture want from our female protagonists has changed dramatically. I call it the curse of the strong female character. Can't talk? No, you intimidate them. Good God, you're a woman. <laughs> Now, I don't want to go blaming the surge of superhero movies that have dominated our film industry since 2008, but it's impossible to ignore as a factor. With most traditional superheroes being men, these superhero movies have naturally tilted us in the direction of male-led movies. In response to this, the cry for strong female characters rang out pretty strong. Women who could keep up with the guys, who were just as badass or better to prove just how cool they were, just how much women belonged in the genre. I'm talking the lone female hero standing amongst all her male counterparts and you know what I'm talking about. However, these strong female characters came down with a curse, being gradually stripped of nuance in favor of becoming badass because keeping up with men is the only way to prove they're strong and deserve to be included in the genre. Women and men, and especially when we add in race and sexuality, do still have vastly different experiences in life, but we can't reflect that in the strong female character unless it's her specifically taking down 20 guys without a scratch because she is just that cool. We don't see these women actually earning their strength like the Nolan Batman film showed Bruce Wayne earning his stripes in a training montage, or Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man taking his sweet time before actually truly stepping into the hero role. Again, there are exceptions, but we're talking in general. With this strong female character, we of course must introduce the cowering woman, who is either pathetically under the boot of a man or is liberated by the strong female character. Because these female characters lack nuance and just aren't being written well despite having the potential, we end up with stuff like Game of Thrones. Look at our strong female character just completely losing her mind and slaughtering innocent people, just like a crazy man! Wow! Equality! The result of the strong female character who has been written a thousand times since superhero movies became the next big thing? Yeah. Women who become one-dimensional in an attempt to prove that they are just as good or better than men, and this has even transitioned into animation, where plenty of people have noticed female characters being punched right out of the same mold in order to seem more corporate woke. Traits that are deemed too feminine are stripped away because then they're not as awesome as the men or aren't woke enough. And these writers have no clue what woke storytelling is actually about. In general, women cannot be nurturers. Women cannot show weakness. Women are gradually losing love interests, unless specifically in a love story. I mean, note, men can get love interests. That's fine, so long as it's the men controlling the love story, not the woman a la the Hobbit movies. While variety is a good thing and what led to so many iconic female characters from the 80s on, what we end up with is this oversaturated market with the female protagonist who is good at things without earning it, who is independent and doesn't need a love interest and increasingly doesn't have one, and who makes superficial mistakes that don't have real consequences, like in the new MCU show Echo. Also, Disney just thinks that if they make a character black, this makes them woke and with the times. Uh, yeah, I don't even want to get into that. Oh, boy. And then she got into it anyway. However, after a decade of the strong female character, now people are pushing back against this trope because, yeah, it's overdone and we're over it. But without the strong female character who's occupied the space for so long, what is the new female character we are looking for? If the reaction to Wish is anything to go by, we would like to have romance again. 
It's awesome to have female characters who don't have romance in their lives, but with stories gradually writing romance out, the shift to allowing romance to enter especially our fairy tales again is definitely there. And there's certainly a lot of pushback against the strong female character as defined by the superhero genre. Just look at how Marvel's latest movies and shows about female characters have completely bombed both critically and with audiences. Or check out the reaction to subversive films like Damsel. We've had enough of those so-called empowering films because, hi, we've had a lot of them. Maleficent, Snow White and Huntsman, etc., which were awesome when there weren't so damn many of them. A lot of what audiences want is still up in the air, though. Women who follow traditional gender roles still tend to be looked down upon, so the nurturers and caregivers are still not good, yet they're also not good if they show signs of the strong female protagonist. Then there's the problem of the adorkable protagonists of many modern family films from Ruby Gilman to Asha. This was endearing when it was just Rapunzel, but it's become a trope. It also doesn't help that there are less women in leading our main roles to experiment with what audiences might want. So honestly, I don't have a clue what the new standard is, but it's harsh trying to toe the line between old school, not feminist, and strong female character that audiences are going to hate to find our new female protagonist that we as a culture now desire. So now I've gotten the lecture out of the way, how does Charlie conform or defy these odd expectations? Charlie does not fit the strong female character nor the new standard. As the strong female character, yeah, she has her moments. Her strength is explained by her lineage. She is the princess of hell and therefore naturally strong. It's not as satisfying as actual training arcs, but her moments of badassery don't come out of nowhere. She still gets beat up, so her strength is limited. Notably, she does not have a male counterpart to keep up with and prove her badassery against, aka women in a band of superheroes, but Charlie's main strength is not in fighting, so she's not the strong female character. Instead, Charlie embodies traditional female characteristics that we both abhor and embrace in the new standard. She has a love interest, but an established one, so no romance the way we are trained to want it, the exciting get-together. Main characters do not tend to begin and end a show in the same relationship. Most lasting relationships are side characters like parents, etc. But with notable exceptions, don't come at me, Moira and Johnny from Schitt's Creek, Mitch and Cam from Modern Family, actually a lot of couples from Modern Family. All are older characters and many of them are parents or become parents, but they're not side characters. Like, they exist, but I think we can admit they are a rarer breed. I struggle to think of a teen slash 20-something couple that pulled this off, but I haven't watched every TV show ever made, so let's just leave it at they are rare. Actually, let's just admit that most famous fictional couples did not start off together or have significant upheaval during their relationship, while Vicky and Charlie can't maintain an argument for a full episode. So Charlie does not fit the romantic standard, and we do sort of crave the familiar when it comes to certain things, like our fictional romances. It's why the same tropes work again and again and again. Haha, <laughs> there was only one bed. While Charlie does fight, her true strength lies in her desire for diplomacy and unity, so she is a pacifist. She only fights heaven when it becomes the only way to protect those at the hotel, and afterwards she still blames herself for failing at diplomacy. Her moment of triumph is in uniting hell, the cannibals, by using her natural way of wanting to get through to people. Singing! Which is definitely one of those things that we attribute to the old school Disney princesses who were not feminist enough for us. Now, of course, her big, big moment of triumph is Serpentius, even if she doesn't know it. And that was through her extraordinary amount of compassion and understanding because Charlie is, <gasps> gasp, a nurturer as her prime role in the story. Charlie provides a space within the hotel where sinners are able to interact positively with each other. They don't have to kill or be killed, and this allows them to develop within a safe space. She is not afraid to express love and caring. But her gentle nature can lead to the men in her life becoming very overbearing, and since she has an established relationship, she has no control in a will-they-won't-they situation. This makes it seem as though Charlie lacks control, when in fact she controls the environment in which these characters thrive. But that's not obvious. 
so Charlie is not the strong female character, yet still shows the traditional female characteristics that spawned the desire for the strong female character in the first place. It's a rock and a hard place. What do audiences actually want from her? All right, so why, in this weird, twisted expectation of what female protagonists should be, would Charlie be seen as a bad or boring protagonist, going into specifics? Well, first of all, we don't know what we actually want from her, but also, Charlie develops as the show goes on, which is both a strength and a weakness, a weakness that can make her seem boring. She begins the show as incredibly naive, attempting to rehabilitate sinners when she has no idea what leads people to sin. Her parents were not judged as sinners, but judged by angels instead. And even when she loves a sinner, that turns out to be Vaggie, who was originally an angel. Charlie has been sheltered and surrounded by non-sinners, and a father who hates sinners, so she doesn't understand how to rehabilitate them. She grows through the season as she learns about the hypocrisy of heaven, as well as screwing up a few times with Angel, with understanding her dad, with learning to accept her own emotions, but it takes her time to get there. Since Charlie at the beginning of the show is not the same as the one at the end, she may not be as initially engaging as other more eccentric characters. Lots of people enjoy Alistair, for example, Vox, Angel, because those characters are immediately interesting and more, let, let's say, colorful than Charlie. But while spending one episode focused on Angel was great for him, the entire show couldn't be shown from his perspective as it involves rehabilitations of multiple sinners, which Charlie is able to provide as a non-sinner looking in. In this way, Charlie is almost her own straight man, which doesn't often happen and almost always shifts focus to a different character. Think of Nick from The Great Gatsby, an outsider looking in on the opulence and corruption of money, but also a side character to the story of Gatsby. Or there's Chief Bromden and Randall McMurphy in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, where Bromden is the narrator, but the story is about McMurphy and his conflict with Nurse Ratched. Veggie alleviates Charlie's straight man role a little, but is still far more outspoken than Charlie and can at times make her in into even more of a straight man to balance out the more extreme parts of Veggie's personality. Husk would actually fall naturally into the straight man role if he had a larger part, but since he didn't, that part does end up in Charlie's court fairly often, so she gets what could be called the Nick effect. The shift in focus isn't on her, but rather on those around her. All right, so we can accept that Charlie develops and becomes more interesting as she develops. Why not start her off more interesting? Because if Charlie was as she is at the end, at the beginning of the show, it would feel unearned. Batman without his training arc. Tobey Maguire being the perfect Spider-Man right off the bat. Coming in as naturally understanding with the capability to be a leader and stand up to heaven's corruption would make her incredibly boring, since I guess she would have just been born like that? Despite her sheltered upbringing and absolutely no reason to be that way without her trial through fire she experiences in season one, she's just like that? That's awful writing. So this means that Charlie relies on her sweet, forgiving personality to initially endear her to the audience, which might not be accepted because it's traditionally feminine and airs on the side of a dorkable, which is a no-no these days. And it takes a while for her to develop into a character who is as interesting as the side character, making her seem very plain, while in fact she's the one experiencing the most development. Ironically, Charlie is seen as boring, while lots of people, myself included, really love Lucifer. But the two characters are incredibly similar in terms of personality. Lucifer just tweaked up to 2000% until he settles down and stops trying to compete with Alistair. Episode 5, therefore, is incredibly important for Charlie's character for us to understand the whys of who she is and to give her a foil. Maybe not the most traditional foil in the Macbeth Banquo style, where Macbeth goes completely off the rails, but still a foil as a very similar character where the differences highlight who Charlie really is. Someone who still believes she can affect change and hasn't been beaten down by a corrupt system. She is also a character who can cause development in others, unlike Lucifer, as evidenced by the fact she managed to influence him, and this is what makes it believable that she'll be able to rehabilitate sinners and perhaps go further and change the systems of heaven and hell entirely. The best main characters are those who influence the characters around them, and Charlie does that. But the fact Charlie is so similar to her father highlights why she might be seen as boring. Lucifer does come into the show at 2000% full throttle and only chills out and shows a gentler, loving side, like Charlie's and oh my gosh does the man cry easily, after she calls him out for not supporting her. 
This is the opposite of Charlie, who grows to full throttle, coming from a meeker self. So while the two characters meet in the middle, Lucifer whap bap booms into the story, creating immediate impact. Because the show is fast-paced and packed with interesting characters, this introduction is necessary for someone introduced so late, but does demonstrate how Charlie could have maybe been introduced with more pizzazz rather than presenting the story of hell and then almost immediately swapping over to meet the great stealer of scenes, Alistair. So the way Charlie is introduced can be directly compared to Lucifer to see where the problems might lie. And a lot of those problems might be that she had an introduction that was mostly giving us exposition compared to how the rest of the hotel residents come in with their big full personalities that dwarf her intro. Okay, but big thing here I'm gonna get into. Within the context of a musical, Charlie is a problem. Many of her numbers, Happy Day in Hell, You Didn't Know, Ready for This, The Show Must Go On, are the more traditional Broadway numbers a la Les Mis, West Side Story, Cats, where large casts support the main singer, swap main singers, and often change styles or swell as the song builds. One Day More from Les Mis is a good example from a different musical of beginning with a single main character and building up to nearly the entire cast and is important plot-wise, but not necessarily fun to hum along to. In Husband, side characters have fun, visually amazing songs like Stayed Gone, Hell's Greatest Dad, Loser Baby, and Poison, which are clearly solos or duets without a background choir, but Charlie lacks one of those. Because Charlie does not have a solo that isn't backed by other characters, only Angel and Carmilla do. This is not good. In most musicals, the lead character has a song or multiple songs that are solo or mostly solo that help define their character. For example, and there are plenty to back me up here and I'm not even scratching the surface. In Phantom of the Opera, Christine sings Wishing You Were Somehow Here Again as a way to say goodbye to her father, whose death continues to hold her back from growing as a person. And Music of the Night is the Phantom song as it explains his ideology and the world he wants to introduce Christine to, the world he feels he belongs in. In Les Mis, Valjean sings Who Am I before deciding to reveal himself as prisoner to 4601 because he cannot let an innocent man be blamed for his crimes. He also sings Bring Him Home and pledges to bring Marius home safe from the barricades, even if it kills him, in order to make Cosette happy, be ending his dependent relationship with her, while his foil Javert sings Stars that explains his mindset about Valjean and later, when reprised, why he commits suicide. Marius, while not a main main, sings Empty Chairs at Empty Tables to express his grief at the revolution that achieved nothing, while Fontaine has her famous I Dreamed a Dream and Eponine has On My Own. There are a lot of famous solos in Les Mis. Wicked has Divine Gravity, which includes some lines from Glinda, but is undoubtedly Elphaba's big number in which she expresses her independence and becomes the Wicked Witch, but also I'm Not That Girl, which contrasts to Elphaba's later affair with Fiero, and No Good Deed, which is her tipping point. West Side Story, Tony sings Maria to declare his love, and Somewhere was originally a solo in the Broadway run, though this was changed to a duet in the film, and these two songs are arguably the best known from the whole show, but you could make a uh, argument for I Feel Pretty. In Cats, Memory is the song that ends with Grizabella being sent to have a new life, even if there's no real main character in Cats. Memory is the number from the show that rather makes Grizabella a main character just because she sings it. So all hail Elaine Page, the queen. Cabaret has Maybe This Time, which is melancholy over Sally's lack of love and fame and in love, but with a hopeful note that maybe this time it'll work out, and that song has been transferred into other media, like Schitt's Creek, to have meaning for characters there, which demonstrates just what a powerful song it is. Heck, even Disney songs have major solos that are iconic hits. Think Let It Go, or any of the I Want songs, like Part of Your World, Out There, I Can Go the Distance, Reflection, How Far I'll Go. Most Disney musicals have an I Want solo song where the main character expresses their desires. Most of these songs are remembered as major songs from the musical and oftentimes the one people will recognize. Part of your world being a prime example. However, Charlie does not get a big solo song which takes the formula of a musical that has been has actually been following pretty closely and just doesn't follow through there. The songs themselves tell us that Charlie is less important because she doesn't get a solo song to express her feelings or her growth. 
She does get duets in It Starts With Sorry, More Than Anything, and More Than Anything Reprise, the last two being the best Charlie songs to her expressing her feelings, and many, many famous duets are important in musicals. Phantom of the Opera, obviously, is Christine's struggle between the allure of the forbidden and the light. Something Good from Sound of Music is the main love song. For Good from Wicked reconciles Alphaba and Glinda, etc. So I don't want to diminish the importance of Charlie's duets, but again, not solos, which when compared to the fact Carmilla got a solo song, is really sad. And her first duet is mostly about establishing Serpentius as a character, so her first real duet where Charlie gets the spotlight to express her feelings isn't until episode 5 with more than anything, and the next one is an actual reprise of that song, which while beautiful means that Charlie gets literally one melody to express her feelings through a more intimate duet. Big musical oops. Uh, but too long don't listen because Charlie develops so much she starts off as less complex as she ends which allows other characters to hog the spotlight a little with their very presence and their songs and that sort of blocks the fact that Charlie is changing. It isn't until episodes 4 and 5 that it becomes apparent she is trying to become better and succeeding but 3 episode rule. While this normally applies to giving up on shows after three episodes, famously applied to Madoka Magica, it also means that people may subconsciously stop trying to give Charlie a chance to be an interesting protagonist after those three episodes are up. And we've seen more of Alistair, Angel, the V's, etc., who are character eye candy. Her lack of a big solo song also defies the traditional form of musicals, making her seem like less of a main character because of what she lacks in a formula we've grown used to. Relying on simply an adorable personality and her kindness for the first three episodes just doesn't cut it in some people's eyes, and I can totally understand that. But why is Charlie a good protagonist? Charlie is a good protagonist in my eyes for two main reasons. She develops through the show, and she screws up. Yes, development. While I also listed it as a reason she could be considered bad, it is one of her greatest strengths as a protagonist. It's pretty undeniable that the Charlie of episode 8 is not the same as the one we meet in episode 1, but she retains the central parts of who she is. Development means taking the parts of who she is and maturing them, not changing her personality. She wants to believe in diplomacy. She wants to convince Adam of her dream, and then later wishes she could have convinced Heaven to work together even after the extermination. She's inherently kind. She's willing to give people second and third chances. And she stops Lucifer from killing Adam once he is no longer a threat. She is an optimist, believing that role-playing saying no to drugs will make a difference, but then also rebuilding the hotel with the strength and goal of rehabilitating sinners. Uh, most notable to me, she loves. Charlie gets emotionally attached to people very easily and isn't afraid to express this, whether it's telling a crowd that she loves them or admitting to Veggie that she's scared of what will happen on extermination day and she loves people even when they don't love her back. Angel Dust doesn't show any appreciation for what she is trying to do until episode 4, but the fact she cares about him is undeniable. Now, what has caused that maturity? She has now experienced the world in a new way, and takes those experiences to heart. Charlie has stopped believing in the corrupt system of heaven and hell, and now relies on herself and her loved ones to do the work. She begins the series attempting to get Heaven on her side, attempts to bypass Adam to convince the Heavenly Court of her goal, and then finally rebuilds the hotel without looking for any approval from Heaven. She takes the fate of the hotel into her own hands. This is beautifully shown in the way Charlie begins the series by reading out the story of Hell, but then being told by her father, who she helped to believe in her and her goal, that her story has just begun. Maybe the cover has been closed on the story of Hell, but the story of Charlie Morningstar is still being written, as someone who is actually changing Hell for the first time in its entire existence. She also believes in herself by the end and stands up for her ideals in a way that wasn't evident in episode 1. This can be nicely tracked across episodes, from the way she can't stand up to Adam, doesn't have a clue how to save sinners aside from games, skits, and trust exercises, she meddles with Angel's life in episode 4, promoting her ideals but in the entirely wrong setting, but then convincing her father to support her dream because she needs to save her people more than anything. That's a big win. To standing up to Sarah and Heaven, winning over Cannibal Town through singing even though she says that never works, and finally leading the hotel to victory, even if it got destroyed. Now she works up from rock bottom with the support of her loved ones. Charlie screwing up is also the sign of a great main character. 
The best characters experience setbacks due to their own screw-ups, not someone else's. It gives them a better chance to grow. And I do mean screw-ups that have actual consequences. Charlie screws up. Like her dad, or her foil, she tends to hyperfocus. When Serpentius joins the hotel, Charlie forgives his attacks and focuses on him to the detriment of Angel. For a long time, Charlie does tend to get hung up on certain ideas and can't move past them easily, such as trust exercises, which in episode 5 you can see she is still trying to build into her web of saving sinners. She also gets hung up on mindsets as well, her relationship with her parents being a prime example, and learning to move past those mindsets is a show of maturity. I mean, she didn't ask Lucifer for help until they had only a month left. That's yikes. Moving past the idea of relying on heaven is another hurdle that she surpasses in favor of relying on her loved ones and her own strength. But Charlie does tend to fixate to the detriment of those around her, who are more complex than her one-track thinking and can often accommodate. But she gets better. Another screw-up related to the last one, because her one-track thinking can lead to miscommunication, Charlie has to learn to see things from people's points of view. Take her paying attention to Serpentius. Now, to be fair, would Charlie have been upset by someone paying more attention to the new guy? No. But it doesn't cross her mind that Angel might be, because, again, she does not have the experience to actually understand sinners. Most of the time that Charlie puts someone in an uncomfortable position, like asking Vega to lead the trust exercises, is something that Charlie would be completely comfortable with, so her mistakes are in not realizing that everyone is the same as her. With good reason, because most of us have to do this at some point, let's be real. But that mistake of hers is also really hung out to dry when her foil is introduced, and she has to see things from Lucifer's point of view. Perhaps for the first time, really needing to examine the way her life experiences versus someone else's have allowed her to believe in redemption, while her father's and other sinners' experiences might not. And of course, there is Vaggie's big secret. In both instances with Lucifer and Vaggie, Charlie allows herself to express negative emotions, which are justified and does hurt the people she has to learn to understand. She is unable to understand Lucifer's position in regards to heaven. He already tried and failed to make his dreams a reality, and is terrified of what more heaven might take from him. He is not in the position of power she thought he was. She also assumed because of the lack of communication that he didn't care about her, when we know it's much more than that. And, from his end, he was the one nervous about contacting her because of the constant fear of failure as a father. Which, ironically and sadly, is causing him to be a failure of a father. By the end of episode 5, though, Charlie has come to understand him and his point of view, and they are able to reconcile and express how much they mean to each other. Similarly, she lets her emotions out when it comes to Vaggie keeping her secret, wondering what about Vaggie is the truth and what could be more lies, but Rosie is able to help her understand where Vaggie was coming from and why she would keep such a secret, allowing Charlie to forgive Vaggie and the two can affirm their love for each other. So the final shot of Charlie in episode 1 has Vaggie on one side and her father on the other, the two people she had to learn to truly understand and who she has grown close slash closer to as a result. This skill, empathy in its purest form, is something that Charlie needs to teach to sinners and to heaven. Sinners who can come to care about each other when they accept each other and their sordid pasts, aka grant forgiveness, and heaven, which needs to learn empathy for sinners who are learning to atone, but it's also a skill that Charlie does not have at the beginning. She loves, but she doesn't understand, but she learns understanding along the way. Another mistake to correct, Charlie also initially doesn't know her boundaries slash pushes people who aren't ready past their boundaries. She places Vaggie in charge of trust exercises and then critiques Vaggie's solution. She shouldn't have put that burden on Vaggie so suddenly and then criticized her for what she came up with on the spot. Again, would Charlie have been bothered by suddenly having an exercise given to her? No, but again, part of Charlie's flaws is the inability to see other people's point of view until episode 5 when she has that big shift. She crosses a huge boundary by visiting Angel's work and not immediately listening to him when he asked her to leave. But that's why she begins to grow, understanding that her actions hurt Angel and that she needs to change in order to meet her guest in the middle. Unlike her, they are often not in a place where they can drop everything else about their lives and devote everything to the hotel, so again, that whole seeing things from other people's point of view. So, Charlie's screw-ups allow her to learn and grow and be the leader she will need to be for season 2. In the end, her screw-ups lead to growth, 
And as she grows, she can screw up in different ways. And it's a vicious cycle, except not vicious at all, because it makes Charlie a better and more interesting character every time. Musically, although she lacks the big protagonist solo, her numbers are still important in establishing the setting, the plot, and her own growth. So even when while she's usually accompanied by a choir or is in a duet, her numbers always have meaning. Charlie is also the meaning of the show wrapped up in one cute little package. Optimism in the face of obstacles that might seem impossible to overcome. She wants to take the denizens of hell and redeem them. This Disney princess-coded protagonist sings among the screaming and loves sinners despite their pasts and sometimes despite their presence as well. She grants endless empathy in a world where neither heaven or hell offer it. Her existence is a contradiction in the same way the show exists as a contradiction. Adult themes and humor in whimsical animation, musical numbers set against the backdrop of eternal punishment. Charlie is the show. She is everything that has made it such a standout sensation that people can't stop talking about, whether it's praise or condemnation. Hey, both work as publicity. You can point to Charlie and say, yeah, this here, this is what Has Been Hotel is in a way that you can't with any other character. Maybe she's not the flashiest, but she embodies Has Been Hotel down to her bones, and I love that about her. So, objectively, is Charlie a good protagonist? In terms of experiencing growth, Charlie is an interesting protagonist as she develops the most of all the characters. But she does lack presence at the beginning of the show due to being surrounded by colorful characters and being forced into the straight man role. She might fail the three episode rule, which again is usually used to drop a show if not into it after three eps, but can also be used as a subconscious or conscious rule to drop a character if they haven't nabbed attention by three episodes in, and Charlie starts to develop in episode four, majorly in episode five, and those changes are manifested in six onwards. In terms of music, while her numbers are important, they aren't earworms in the same way other songs are, and she does not get her main character solo, or any straight out solo in fact, so just in terms of the structure of a musical, she is shown as less important. The major problem that Charlie faces is that we don't know what we want from our female protagonists at this point, and everyone is going to have their own opinion, not only about what they want, but on Charlie as well. So, well, for me, she's interesting because of how she develops, and I think she's one of the best protagonists I've seen in a while. For someone with a different expectation of what female leads should be, Charlie could be seen as a failure. And this is all a result of our society shifting away from the strong female protagonist into this unknown territory where we're not really sure what we want. We know what we don't like in characters, but what are the traits we actually do want? Is Charlie boring? While I love her, she isn't my favorite character. Again, that goes to her foil. I apparently have a thing for guys who love ducks. But in a show with so many interesting characters, it's not a surprise that someone might whap bap boom their way into your heart. Or whatever it is that Alistair does to get people to love him. But just because she isn't my favorite doesn't mean she's a failure of a protagonist, and that's an important distinction. I have a hard time actually remembering the last show I watched or book that I read where the main character was my absolute fave because side characters are allowed to get a little more eccentric and don't have to steer the plot car in the same way. They get to turn the music up and stick their heads out the window and chant from McDonald to McDonald to McDonald and that's fun! But steering the plot car is important and it doesn't mean Charlie can't turn up the music and sing along. And ultimately, it depends on what we want out of our female protagonists, of which there are too few, and the expectations are often so strict for. So, in the end, it is always up to personal interpretation. There are reasons Charlie can be considered a weak protagonist, and reasons she can be considered great. I tend to lean towards the latter because character development is something really important to me and something I specifically watch for during movies, books, and TV shows, but not everyone consumes media the way I do. My entire secondary education was about doing deep dive analysis into media, but that's not all of us and that's fine. It's important to get all sorts of viewpoints when discussing media so that your own opinions don't exist in a vacuum. So. Let me know in the comments what you think about Charlie, what worked for you and what didn't, what you want out of a female protagonist in this age of shifting expectations, and also what you hope comes out of season two, now that Charlie has progressed from her episode one self into her episode eight self, because that has already promised that she will be a protagonist to watch out for, now that she has experienced that oh so very important development. There's a lot Charlie is going to have to deal with, but she isn't the same naive woman who has trouble seeing anyone's perspective but her own. 
but a more mature, more confident, more empathetic character who has said, screw the system, and is making her own rules now. Rules built out of genuine love for her people and a belief that she can make things better with the support of those around her. Thanks for listening. I know this got long. My name is Kira. If you like my content, please consider uh, liking, subscribing, leaving that comment about what you think about Charlie. I would love to hear from you. And I will see you again later. Bye.